Hello, everyone, and welcome to the first episode of Breaking Monero. Breaking Monero is a series of episodes where we explain the limitations of Monero's security and privacy in a comprehensive and understandable way. We will give a sneak peek into some of the work done behind the scenes to evaluate risks and to make Monero better. It's an ongoing process, and we're happy to have you uh, here along with us for this part of Monero's journey. So to introduce your hosts, uh, my name is Justin Ehrenhofer. I'm the organizer of the Monero Community Workgroup, and I've been talking to people about Monero for about three years and have really been looking at ring signatures in particular for about the past year and a half. But I know that you're here to hear from our other two major guests, Sarang and Saray. Sarang, can you please introduce yourself? Hello, um, I, uh, I go by Sarang Nother, and I am a PhD researcher working uh, for the Monero Research Lab. And along with Saray, who will introduce himself shortly, um, I do full-time work doing analysis, um, protocol improvements and developments, uh, security reviews, and things like that for the Monero project and the surrounding Monero ecosystem. And that, of course, involves a whole lot of different things, um, one of which is to examine some of Monero's limitations and how we iterate on those to make them better, which is the purpose of being here for this episode series. Good to it. All right, Saray. Uh, hi, I am Brandon Goodell. Uh, my handle on the Monero channels is Saray Noether. Um, I've been working and looking at Monero uh, working with and looking at Monero for uh, about four or five years now. Um, <clears throat> one of the most important parts about uh, security uh, when it comes to cryptography, uh, finances, um, just security in general, is to try to expose problems in the system to try to make it better. Uh, and I think that talking uh, about how to break Monero um, and bringing issues to light is going to do a lot of good things for uh, people's financial privacy. In particular, it's not going to uh, mislead people down a garden path thinking that Monero is the most secure thing in the world. Um, and maybe, you know, uh, if you're using technology that involves encryption uh, to keep yourself safe in your everyday experiences, um, <clears throat> then uh, knowing exactly the limitations of how that technology works uh, knowing exactly what it does and does not do is going to be very critical to the way that you go about using that technology. Um, so conversations like breaking Monero are really important and they're going to make Monero better. All right. Thank you, Saray and Sir uh, Sarang. We're really pleased to have both of you on. This is going to be a multi, this is a, a series of multiple episodes where we'll be diving into several limitations of Monero when it comes to mostly related to privacy, but also related to security and what we can see going forward. Breaking Monero is a series that really helps people understand these limitations going forward, what it really means to people and how people might have to adapt in order to meet these sort of limitations. It's for someone who already understands the basics of Monero, understands maybe what a ring signature is on a broad level. So make sure to take the time to look at existing community resources there if you have not already looked at those uh, before. And it's, uh, it's, it's not for someone though that uh, is looking to go directly into the math and other related resources. For that, we have other resources like Zero to Monero where you can take a, a deep dive into the cryptography. The, the level of math and cryptography covered in this series is going to be very slim to none. It, it's really on making sure everyone understands the big major ideas from these regards. Um, but ultimately, we want to talk about these going forward in the series. One important thing to note is that Monero's privacy and security over time have changed dramatically. It's not a sort of static situation where privacy has stayed the same over the years. Instead, Monero is really an evolving testbed of sorts in terms of the level of privacy and security that it provides and how it provides these different mechanisms going forward. Sarang, did you have something? Yeah, I mean, I think I think a common misconception in this space and kind of just in the cryptographic and kind of computer science space in general too, is that things like privacy and anonymity are just some kind of switch where it's either off or it's on and you have it or you don't. And I understand why people have those misconceptions. I mean, projects like Monero often kind of just to make things easier for people, just say, oh, you know, we're, we're private or we're anonymous or we're fungible or whatever you want. Um, but 
I mean, even kind of down at the base formal level, when it does come down to the math that we're not going to talk about, there are ways to formalize kind of the different threat models and use cases for which you might want types of privacy or anonymity. So it, it all really depends on very particular models. Um, so when we say things like private or anonymous, it really does become an iterative process, kind of taking different threat models that people have, different common use cases people have, and trying to tailor the way that we design the system and how people use the system in order to meet those needs. So, you know, people say, you know, why do you keep changing this all over time? And, you know, why is it iterative? Why can't you just go and get it right all at once? Well, it's, it's because the formalization of this is very complex and the way that people use it, it changes over time as well. You know, as we're gonna talk about later, as I'm sure you're gonna mention, you know, people are probably going to be using exchanges more often. And we're gonna talk about the fact that that comes with certain consequences, as opposed to folks just kind of using a cryptographic asset in a peer to peer sense. So as people change their uses over time, and as we have a better understanding of what those threat models are, we iterate on it. So Monero does continue to get better over time. It should continue to get better over time, and it does continue to get better over time. So it's not a switch. We just keep making it better. I think everyone else is muted. Another thing that I would like to point out uh, actually, it was pointed out to me recently uh, by uh, Josh uh, Josh Goldbart at uh, at Mobilecoin. Uh, he he pointed out the difference between privacy and secrecy. Um, the idea of privacy may include something like protecting your neighbors from being able to peek into your house, but the idea of secrecy is something like complete and total secrecy, information stored inside of a black hole. And uh, there are gradients from one end to the other. And I think that a lot of people in the space, like Saram just pointed out, think that privacy, uh, or excuse me, secrecy is just a switch that you can turn on and all of a sudden all of your information is in a black hole. When in fact, really, we have to climb this mountain of privacy inch by inch, um, attacking one feature at a time uh, because there really is no way to obtain perfect secrecy. Um, and not only that, uh, yeah, that's all I'll say about that, actually. <laughs> if you could cut that part out, that'd be great. <laughs> well, that's, I mean, that's also a really good point, too, especially when it comes to something like a cryptographic asset where you are inherently interacting you know, publicly with people. You, know, you may be keeping things about your transaction secret and safe with Monero, but you're still broadcasting data to the entire world. You know, it'd be a pretty useless ledger if it only existed in a black box. So you know, if you want perfect secrecy, encrypt all your data, you know, chop all your ethernet cables in half, throw away your Wi-Fi router and don't talk to anybody. Um, that's, I guess, kind of a black box for information secrecy, but it's also pretty useless. So the fact that we have to do interactions means that there is information flowing. And the fact that there's information flowing means that you know, the attack surface we have to consider is pretty large. But once again, like uh, has been said, it is not a switch. It's like, yeah, a mountain where you're not quite sure where the top is, you keep climbing anyway. Yeah, and I think that's generally an important distinction. I know that Sarang, uh, the two of us include this in our, a lot of our talks about privacy, that sure, a future might make something on or off, but it doesn't mean something's perfectly private or perfectly transparent. So it's important to stratify uh, or sort of communicate that to people that these are very nuanced. It's, it's very difficult to say what exact will provide privacy provides. And the best way we really can do that is based off people's use case and their threat models are trying to go around. Um, any other last comments on the difficulty of privacy and how it sort of changes over time in Monero? Or should we keep moving on to talk about, yeah, OK, go ahead. Uh, I do have one more comment. And this is actually sort of a more broad comment about the world in general. Um, privacy, information privacy, is an, a race between you and people who want your information. It's an arms race. It's like a cold war. And as you develop new technologies, you're going to find people who figure out ways to just kind of heuristically get around the fact that you hid some information with cryptography. Um, the simplest example of this is the $4 wrench attack, right? The best way to get somebody's private keys is to threaten them, to threaten them over the head with a wrench. Um, and so uh, I, I think that I forgot where I was going with this. I'm sorry. We're not live streaming this on YouTube, are we? 
Nope. Okay, awesome. Whatever it is, I'm that. sure it was green and insightful. We have many episodes to eke it out again. <laughs> yeah, so this is the first episode, right? Um, all right, so to cover some of the things that we will be speaking about in later episodes, um, we're really talking about things that are most relevant to Monero today, at least as the main focus, what the real limitations and privacy and security are now. But in order to understand a lot of these current uh, concerns, we also need to look to the past a little bit and discuss what previous issues that Monero has had and how we've addressed them. And we'll cover some of the basics in breaking Monero, such as zero decoy transactions, which again, are not a concern in Monero anymore, but were a, a, a large issue that Monero needed to address and improve upon as we made Monero better and more private going forward. However, we will still cover quite a few current, uh, current considerations like metadata analysis, like poison output analysis, like, um, like IP metadata analysis, and quite a few other potential attacks where people will try to either probably know something or heuristically try and figure out more information about other users to potentially impact the information learned as, as you're transacting on the Monero blockchain. So these are all things to look forward to going into the next few episodes. Uh, but of course, you need to keep in mind what your use case is when using Monero. Again, what are you trying to use Monero to protect you from? If you are just using Monero to try and hide a, a Christmas present or a holiday present that you're purchasing for one of your friends, you probably don't need an, a very, very strict sort of threat model. Meanwhile, if you're in a country where they are trying to surveil everything that you're doing on the internet, you obviously have a much stricter threat model. So we need to sort of try and help balance these things. This Breaking Monero series can't tell you what your specific use case is, but we can try and cover what sort of considerations you should be thinking about, and you as a listener will have to figure out if it's, it's really important to you and if it's relevant to you. Um, do either of you have a, a recommendation in sort of helping people make that sort of determination? Um, well, I guess one thing I'd like to say too is that I, I really don't like the kind of the, the lack of distinction between things like the word analysis and things like the word attack. So we're going to talk about a lot of different ways that an adversary or, you know, the good guys like us who also want to think like an adversary, you know, there's a lot of different ways that the adversary might try to get certain kinds of information by examining you know, transaction behavior or the Monero blockchain itself. Um, but saying that you have a method of analysis or saying you have an attack, whatever that means, does not necessarily mean you have, you know, broken anything or that you've defeated, uh, you know, a particular use case. So the analogy I like to think of in my head, right, is that you can think of like one of the old school, you know, old stone castle walls. There's a lot of different ways you could try to attack that castle wall. You could try to attack it, I don't know, like with ping pong balls. And that is technically a way you could try to attack a castle wall but it's not really gonna do a whole lot. You know, you could take a giant cannonball and try to use it to attack a castle wall and that's gonna have a much different effect. So we'll talk about different forms of analysis that have different impacts. And like you said, some of them, you know, especially a lot of older uh, forms of analysis might've given the adversary a lot more different types of information than different kinds of analysis today. Um, so I think that's important to keep in mind. So when we talk about attacking Monero, you know, we're not gonna tell you right now how to like de-anonymize people for sure or anything. You know, these are all different forms of analysis that you might do to try to kind of eke out bits of information or ideas behind things we often call heuristics, which are more or less educated guesses about information. They're very different things and it doesn't mean that you necessarily have anything to be terrified about, um, but there are different ways that you might go about trying to do attacks or analysis. Uh, one thing I would like to add <clears throat> is that essentially, even if you compare Monero or other private cryptocurrencies like Zcash uh, or Verge uh, to, uh, if you compare those currencies to something like cash, well, um, how many witnesses to a transaction do you need for a cash transaction? It's just two, usually one person handing off a $20 bill to another person. Um, there may be no other witnesses and no other record of that transaction whatsoever. Um, if we can compare uh, something like Monero to a model that is based on a cash model, and we can 
walk away from that comparison relatively favorably um, or with a list of issues that we can attack about how we're different from something like cash, then we can walk away with some sort of uh, model of how to improve. Um, so if you look, for example, at our different threat models, um, if you have, <laughs> even in a cash-based world, if you have somebody who's spear phishing and they're targeting a specific individual and they are gathering as much information as possible about one specific individual, even if you're using cash, that individual is probably pretty screwed. The law enforcement agents are probably going to mark the bills somehow and trace you down and use serial numbers to catch you. On the other hand, if you have something like dragnet surveillance that's trying to do a large scale uh, analysis of a, like a whole blockchain at once, um, you have some degree of uh, a different model to deal with, right? So if you're the sort of person who's afraid of being spearfished, then uh, yeah, I would say generally try to go live in the woods somewhere and never interact with any human being ever because even your cash transactions are vulnerable. On the other hand, if you're somebody who's interested in avoiding a dragnet surveillance situation, maybe you're a little concerned about the state of how much information Facebook or Amazon have about you, um, then something like Monero might end up uh, providing the sort of protection that you need in order to you know, lead a private lifestyle in the 21st century, which is sort of a joke. But it's a laudable goal anyway. That's why we're all here. It's like government intelligence, it's an oxymoron. All right, thank you both for your comments on that topic. Uh, and we're going to be talking more about those use cases going forward in the specific sort of attacks we'll be discussing in further episodes. So sort of to wrap up and conclude this though, we want to say clearly that Monero isn't perfect. There are, there are issues with Monero. We want to speak about them here, but we feel that by having an open dialogue and communicating what the limitations are with Monero, we have the best chance at making it better and making sure that people are using it in a way where they understand how it works. Sure, it's not gonna be that everyone knows exactly how to use the tool properly. There will be some people that make mistakes or do things certain ways. But we wanna make sure that at the minimum, people who try and learn about how to use this tool, that they can do so in, in the way that they feel comfortable with for whatever threat model they have. And we also want to improve the Monero protocol so more people, so that the normal use model of Monero fits what their, their expectations are for Monero. This is really sort of the things we want to talk about and open a dialogue for outside of the normal research community in this Breaking Monero series to make it more available for the outside community and others to learn about and to get an initial impression of. And overall, we're doing this for the sake of making Monero better, not to point out necessarily uh, why like these limitations exist, therefore Monero is, is terrible necessarily. Everything will always have limitations and we want to speak openly about them and what we've done to try and make them better. And ultimately, I think it's, it's a pretty shared view among most Monero contributors that Monero has been the best tool that you can use to protect your privacy for really its whole existence, where even though Monero has never been perfect and it used to be much worse in the past than it is now, while well, previous privacy solutions in the past were worse than they were now. And everything has sort of improved over time and Monero has continuously led the charge in order to make existing privacy technologies better. At least that's, that's my personal take on it. And I think that by having these discussions, we're able to keep advancing Monero further. So um, I suppose that's all I really have to talk about in this initial breaking Monero introductory effort. It's uh, episode, it's, it's simply, uh, an indication about what we're going to get at in the future when we analyze some of these attacks, discuss some of those terminology in, in a much simpler way. We will have diagrams and images and, and whiteboard type videos, to sh uh, at least diagrams to show people a little bit more clearly how, how everything is intertwining. And we really wanna make this a resource to help you all. So if there's ways for us to tailor this series to help you in that regard, please let us know and we're happy to make this a resource that is hopefully beneficial for you all. Um, any last remarks? Yeah, sir. Uh, great. Uh, there's uh, one last point I want to make out. Uh, <clears throat> there is one last point I would like to make. Uh, you said a moment ago that everybody on the Monero team 
uh, thinks of Monero as the best option right now for privacy preserving technology. Um, and I do want to point out that there are a lot of good options for privacy preserving technology in the cryptocurrency space. Um, they all each stem from a totally different design philosophy. Um, so for example, Zcash uses a trusted setup. And if you trust that setup, then their privacy is fantastic if you stay in the shielded pool and you don't do anything um, silly like giving away your wallet information, then Zcash is great. But Monero has this design philosophy that is inherited from CryptoNote and inherited from Bitcoin that we should try to avoid trusted setups at all costs. Um, personally, I think Monero is the best option because uh, relying on privacy to me isn't as important as lacking a trusted setup uh, because one of the things that cryptocurrencies bring to the world is this algorithmic finance that trusted third parties are removed from the situation. Like that cash transaction I mentioned earlier of two people handing off $20 bill. No trusted third party there. Um, and so uh, even though the design philosophies of these different teams vary, the technology that comes with it, as long as you're willing to assume the threat model of the Zcash situation, that the trusted setup was not violated, Zcash is great. Um, just like if you're willing to take on the threat model of Monero, um, where uh, that we'll be discussing more in this series, um, uh, Monero is better. Uh, so really, it depends on what your personal level of risk tolerance is, what you're willing to trust, and what you're not willing to trust. Um, and so, anyway, I just wanted to point that out. Um, and I guess to kind of follow along with that, you know, as you as you presumably go and examine, you know, alternatives to Monero or things that Monero is based on or things that are based on Monero or, you know, just other projects that are trying to do the same kind of thing. You know, I think going to those and asking for the same kind of analysis should be absolutely expected. You know, any project, any cryptographic project that it's worth its salt should be doing this analysis internally already. Whether or not they tell you about it is a different thing. So... I mean, the Zcash team, for example, does analysis on their projects. And as Brandon had said, you know, there are trade-offs and limitations with that scheme. There are trade-offs and limitations to Monero's as well. So doing this kind of analysis out in the open, I think, speaks both to the strength of Monero and the fact that we do have trust in it, um, but also that an open dialogue about it is important to engender that trust. So you see us doing it. You should demand that your other favorite projects or least favorite projects do the exact same thing. And if they won't, that's a little skeptical. All right, thank you both, uh, Sarang and Saray, for joining us here on our first episode of Breaking Monero. Again, we'll be having other episodes coming out in the near future, so stay tuned. Uh, we'll be covering topics, again, ranging from IP metadata analysis to the difficulty when people reveal a lot of view key information to uh, the poison output attacks. So we're really trying to give a pretty comprehensive view over a lot of the major concerns uh, in Monero today in relation to security and privacy. So again, we're really happy to have you watch us uh, today, and we hope that this will be a useful resource for you going forward. All right, take care, everybody.